right. It is the week of September 11th, 2024, and this is the Fight Business Podcast. I'm your host, Patrick Auger, and I know it's been a while, ladies and gentlemen, but we are back better than ever and have a lot to get through. So first up, we're going to talk about UFC Noche, including the slumping ticket sales, as well as some comments that Dana White has made about the event regarding media partners and possibly turning the event into a movie. We'll deep dive into that. Then we're going to take a look at the latest antitrust lawsuit updates. Mark Shapiro made some very interesting comments we need to address, as well as talk about when the trial is going to set to begin next year and whether or not we may get a new settlement before then. Uh, Then we're going to dive into TKO's potential business headwinds. They have run into some headwinds as of late on both the UFC and WWE side, so we'll kind of take a look at those and see how much it might impact the business, especially reviewing how well they've done this year. We're going to talk Jake Paul making some comments about Conor McGregor's contract status. Uh, we'll look at the validity of those claims as well as you know what the potential impacts could be if Paul's on the right track with his uh, speculation in terms of it affecting the media rights deal that's coming up for the UFC and things of that nature. We'll dive into all of that. And last but not least, we're going to take a look at some Ryzen comments made uh, and strategy regarding pay-per-view so with that in mind we have timestamps at the bottom as always make sure you hit the like subscribe bell notification buttons and let's go ahead and dive right in all right first thing we are going to talk about today is ufc noche which is coming up this saturday presented by riyadh season if you were unaware now if you follow this podcast uh you know what this event is it's at the sphere in las vegas Uh, you have almost assuredly heard about the high ticket prices of this if you're new to the podcast you're new to mma business just to give you a little bit of background when tickets first went on sale for this event uh, dana white ufc president said you know this is going to be a one-off it's going to be a spectacle a love letter to mexico because it is on mexican independence day um and Prices started at around, I think, 27, 2800, maybe 3000. Some people who got immediate access, something like that. Um, but that was for cheapest seat in the house. You're looking at anywhere from 27 to 2700, $3,000. Now, as of this recording, which is prior to the event, by the way, um, the and a couple days out, the cheapest seat you can get on Ticketmaster, so not resale, anything of that nature is $707. That's a substantial drop. It's a $2,000 discount for anybody that waited to buy tickets to this event versus jumping on a pre-sale or right when it became available to the public. Now, for those of you who are unaware of UFC pricing um, and Ticketmaster in general, right? They, they've gotten a lot of flack for this and rightfully so um there's they've got a lot of scrutiny coming for this as well um but essentially for ufc events and for many Ticketmaster events they use what they call dynamic pricing so if there's a higher demand for a particular event that's going to push up prices until you reach an equilibrium of what people are willing to pay so they can maximize profit right for almost all UFC events in the past, oh, I don't know, four or five years, at least since at least post pandemic, um, dynamic pricing has worked against the consumer. Uh, you would often see, hey, like seat pricing in tiers for fight night, I don't know, Mexico City, and you'd look at the price and say, okay, this is you know top tier is going to be around three hundred or something like that. Cool. Then you go to buy the tickets and it's double that. Right. And you official platinum double like near a thousand dollars. And that's very much in part because of dynamic pricing. So the more demand there was, which UFC has been on a red hot streak, the higher those prices go. This is the first time that I can remember um, since I'm sure it's probably happened once before. I want to say. Oh, man, I want to say it was JDS versus even off in Wichita. I don't remember if they had dynamic pricing in place at that point. If they did, I think I think I remember that was one of the few losing 
live events that they've had, like last live events that they've had um, in more recent years. But this is a, a major change for um, what the UFC norm is, right? Um, the gate is obviously going to be affected by this. I, I mean, Dana White had said around 27 million or something like that. Um, now he has revised that down to, I believe, 21 million. Um, and, and it's still going to be a massive gate for the sphere. Do not get me wrong. With production costs, he's also mentioned that, you know, we're talking tens of millions production costs. Um, this is one of the few events, too, where the sphere, I mean, renting it out, doing all the staff. And then from what I've heard on production side of things, because of the equipment that's required and all of that stuff, it, it is extremely pricey. Um, again, I cannot tell you what the exact production costs are, but it's, you know, there's a reason this is a one-off and why they needed to bring Riyadh season in to help sponsor them, right? Riyadh season sponsoring them is going to save them from losing money, I would imagine. Um, but it, it's going to be a far less profitable event than what they're normally used to. Um, and just looking at where ticket prices now and how many tickets are left along with resale, because there's a fair amount of resale out there. You know, I, I it, it's going to be interesting to see if they can get a sellout, right? And and how far prices are really going to drop. Um, I would imagine you're not going to have a sellout here and prices could get down to 500. I, I mean, that's just a, a shot in the dark. I have no inside knowledge or, you know, guess based on math here and, and the drop rate of, you know, this stuff. No, that, there's none of that going on. Um, I, I can't imagine they would allow tickets to drop much more than this. But I mean, I know there are a fair amount of fans that did buy tickets right away that are not happy, right? Because you bought your ticket right out the gate, you know, a pre-sale if you were excited, ready to drop that money. You might have paid three, four thousand uh, dollars for a little bit of a better seat ticket. And now the guy next to you might have only paid eight hundred, nine hundred dollars. And that is a little worrying on the UFC side for a couple of reasons, right? Um, again, this event in particular is not in threat of being not profitable, but if fans see this and it becomes more of a widely publicized piece of information, right? Um, you could get the notion that for a particular fight night, on maybe a less popular card where price, where prices are a little bit high, fans might then begin to think, oh, you know what? I saw for UFC Noche, if I waited, the prices dropped a ton. So I'm going to wait. I'm not going to get into the presale. I'm not going to do all this stuff. And that might cause a little bit of shift in dynamic pricing. Now, does that mean that every fight night is going to suddenly, you know, have tickets start out at $800 and then drop to 300 or something? No. No, of course not. It will not be that drastic. This is a unique situation given that, you know, the starting price of these tickets for the, the nosebleeds was several thousand dollars. Um, so you're not going to see that type of, of change moving forward, even if a lot of people waited and you did have a true customer trend change, right? But what it may do going forward is, you know, if there's enough of an impact, it may be that the dynamic pricing where tickets would normally rise 20, 30% and then be bought by consumers at a 20 or 30% markup from what they originally had might only go up 10 or 15, might only go up five in some cases. That will affect bottom line revenue. Now, you need to look at this from a big picture perspective perspective too because i've seen a lot of people say like oh the business is cold and it, it's finally you know they're they're hitting an issue or hitting a wall with with their popularity and and their um what what comment was it i saw that oh the the cards putting on bad cards with bad fighters is finally catching up to them i think i saw first of all this card is not particularly bad especially if you look at some of the other cards uh with ranked fighters and things of that nature but beyond that um the UFC, right? The live revenue is such a small part of their actual overall. Sorry, live gate and live revenue. It's such a small 
overall part of their business, right? Media rights is, is almost everything. So to them, like, yes, this will maybe affect the bottom line, but it will be a drop in the bucket compared to the majority of their business. Now, as we will talk about later, it still may be impactful and may affect some business decisions. But I mean, this is more of a, this is more like a department at a giant corporation uh, needing to, you know, rework and tweak some things and maybe like having to kind of make adjustments versus like, oh, the actual corporation is really going through a something that's going to affect the whole company, right? This might be a, oh, a single business unit is having or product or service line is having trouble um, or or has been impacted. I, w- I would not even say having trouble, right? Like, I mean, they're still going to make money here. Um, it's just, oh, this wasn't as successful as we hoped. And so we need to make some changes and, and tweak it, right? Like, I mean, that's the kind of lens you have to look at this thing from. Um, it is not a, oh man, the, the whole company is, is, is going cold, right? Like it's not as popular. No, that's not the case. This was a very unique situation, which one they even brought up on their, um, you know, on their reports uh, on their, uh, quarterly earnings report, right? They, they, uh, on their, their earnings calls, they essentially said like, Hey, this one off is here. It's coming up. It's going to be a thing. Um, and there's more to it than that too. Right. Um, in an interview, I think it was with ESPN or with, um, Shannon Sharp, Dana White, you know, talked about how, you know, ideally they turn this thing to a movie and there's going to be fights, but in between the fights, there's going to be these movies or like mini movies that have multiple parts, things of that nature. And it's going to be a unique experience. And I'm sure, right. Like production wise, this is everything I've heard about anything at the sphere has been phenomenal. Um, I, I cannot imagine this is going to be poorly produced or be like, really? Like, that wasn't cool. Like it's, I, if, even if you paid money to go to this and, and it dropped, you're probably still going to have a great time when you get past the fact you may have overpaid for a ticket. Right. Um, but that all being said, Dana talked about, you know, this show could become a movie that they didn't play on the sphere, which they have multiple movies you can go see at the sphere that are like, I think there's a documentary on, uh, like, um, uh, planet earth type thing uh there's there's some there's some different movies that they have running like outside of their concerts and things that they do that you can go and then check it all out and be like whoa this is crazy right so they're talking about basically doing that and then getting some revenue made up through that because if you got a movie playing for a year that's like hey ufc noche and all this cool event stuff and people are going to pay money to go see that awesome they'll gladly go do it right um on top of that You know, this is a, this is a unique event in that media rights partners are going to be there. Um, I know Dana's talked about Canelo and they're mad about the MGM running Canelo uh, at the same time, which again, if your event is supposed to be about, you know, Mexico's Independence Day, Canelo is a huge combat sports stars from Mexico. Uh, And so there's probably some truth and validity to Dana being upset about that because, you know, people who may have been wanting to watch combat sports, didn't have anything, may have been like, oh, I'll watch the UFC's, you know, special Mexican Independence Day uh, event. But now they might say instead, oh, you know, what? I'm going to watch Canelo and then I'll tune into the UFC or what have you or, you know. Um, so there's a little bit there, but I thought it was very interesting um, that when asked, Dana White essentially said that potential media partners are going to be at this event. I think that's a very important detail, right? Um, they are not out of their, you know, they're not technically in the position where they can openly talk to other people, right? Like they're, they're still in an exclusive negotiation window, um, I mean, they're still in the contract. They're, they're not even there, right? Um, <clears throat> but let's be honest. If you've been following Dana White's interviews where he's talked about the media rights coming up, uh, he's kind of hinted at a multiplayer type of deal similar to what the NBA had with multiple carriers. And these talks are definitely happening. You know, um, 
I would be shocked. I, I guess I can't say that for certain, but let me let me say this. I would be shocked if no one at TKO is having any types of talks with media rights partners um, that don't skirt things a little bit, right? Even if it's high level where you're not talking about actual details and monies, you know, there, there's what there's way to to talk about these things without actually talking about them, so you can kind of get gauge interest and and get an idea of where people lie. I cannot imagine that type of negotiation is not happening right now. And especially when Dana White mentions potential media partners being there, I think a big part of this is going to be kind of showing those media partners, you know, hey, this is what the UFC can be, right? This is the type of thing that TKO and the type of event TKO can bring you to. It's a it's a special event. It's a marketing ploy, right? It's essentially, hey, come check us out for this big, we're hosting this big event. You're thinking about maybe jumping into the bidding war when that occurs. Come check out, you know, we're not going to talk about contracts or details or anything like that, but, but come check us out. Come check out these, the types of events we can do, especially when we put some real emphasis and thought and creativity into it. I think it's essentially a marketing ploy of, hey, come look at this product at its best and then judge and hopefully get hooked on the idea of owning it, even though, again, this type of event's almost certainly not going to happen again um, at the sphere, that is. Maybe. I mean, you never know. But unlikely if the UFC is footing the majority of the production costs. But hey, come check it out. Come see what it's all about, that type of thing. I think that's a huge part of this. I think that's a, I think that's one of the main reasons they're doing it, right? Uh, there's, I don't think it's a co coincidence that they're, they've put this event on and booked this event for the end of 2024, right? Um, I guess technically Q3, but the end of Q3. 2024 and you know holidays are kind of a wash because not a lot of people are doing stuff so it's the it's towards the end of the year there's some thought behind that and that's really what you know tk was hoping to get out of this more than anything i think right like the gate uh the you know press around it that's great but it's not going to be something in my opinion um that necessarily warrants a necessarily warrants a hey we're going into this new type of pay-per-view style right maybe depending on what happens with it because it is kind of exploratory right it's new for them but i i really don't think that's the point here i think the main reason that they're doing this is to show off to new potential media partners and and raise the expectations of what a media rights deal with them could look like. That's that's my opinion. I don't have any insider info on that or anything. That's just what I glean from looking at the entire situation. Because again, th this is not the type of event where they're going to make considerable money from the actual live gate. Uh, maybe they'll get a big boost in pay-per-views and that's they're, they're counting on that because they will make you know, I'm sure they'll get some boost from pay-per-view buys. How many, I don't know. But, that, you know, the unique selling point of being at the Sphere certainly could help in that regard. But that's, I, I really think this is more about the media rights deal than anything else. That's my opinion. Uh, and no matter what happens, right, where prices end up, the day of the show, which I will look at and bring up on the next podcast uh, and things of that nature. I mean, they're going to call it a massive success, say it's amazing, all that type of stuff. Unless you have like terrible issues with things which are so blatant they can't deny, but I don't expect that's going to happen. So let me know how excited you are in the comments for UFC Noche. Uh, if you're buying the pay-per-view specifically because it's UFC Noche and they're going to have the stuff at the sphere, um, want to get your thoughts because especially if you're especially if you're buying the pay-per-view and you normally wouldn't but it's oh it's at the sphere i want to see this or if you bought a ticket 
to go um let me know because that's i think important too because they are definitely looking to see how this could attract new potential customers but again i i really think at the heart of this this is a media rights marketing ploy all right next thing we're going to talk about today is where the ufc antitrust lawsuit stands so in case you missed it because i know it's been a while um judge bulware essentially rejected the preliminary agreement between the plaintiffs and the ufc um and everything that we've talked about in terms of the settlement is now technically out the window for now um both parties have expressed you know that they're going to try and work something out and see what they will do but they'll pursue this till you know the most legal action they can etc cetera, etc cetera. um it is an interesting situation. Uh, Judge Bulware, right? I've talked about this a couple times, but especially in this scenario, Judge Bulware was not extremely well versed in antitrust um, stuff. And, you know, the delay on this case from where we sat kind of in that COVID limbo for so long to finally getting to hear everything and then coming to this agreement. Um, it's just a really odd situation, right? Um, and and the rejection of this is basically because Bulware believes that, you know, justice is not done here, that, you know, the plaintiffs essentially have done such a good job arguing their case that Bulware believes, no, more has to be done. There has to be changes to contracts. There has to be more money involved, things of that nature. Now, today, as of this recording, um, Mark Shapiro was at a conference and was asked about, you know, the current state of the lawsuit and, you know, why investors should be okay about the economic outlook of TKO, given that you now have this thing that looks potentially settled, uh, hanging over the company's head. And he had some pretty, um, I'd say his re response was pretty pointed and strong. Right. And he, he said he wasn't going to try and get too emotional, uh, about it, but you know, uh, that he thought this was ridiculous and, you know, that all parties were in agreement and that it really should have been settled and the judge was in the wrong here. But a very important thing that he brought up, because mo most of it was the normal PR you expect from someone like Shapiro. And, you know, his it seemed like there was enough venom in his words. You could tell he was a little bitter about the decision. And, and it was, you know, a, a not just standard PR. It was a little hey, this is my thoughts on the situation. Um, but a very important note that he brought up was that they were willing to pursue legal action until the end, which essentially you can glean from that. Like they're going to, they'll take it to trial if they have to. Uh, they'll appeal it, that type of stuff. And he brought up the NFL Sunday ticket case, which very recently, um, let's see, it would have been beginning of August, right? A federal judge overturned a class action lawsuit um, by the NFL Sunday ticket subscribers against the NFL League. Uh, for those of you international that don't know what that is, essentially American football, uh, NFL, right? Has, there's a, a cable, well, it's not really cable, it's streaming now, package you can purchase so you can watch all the nfl teams games um and it's called sunday ticket because that's the day that football is on all that stuff and so these people had said hey like we believe um you know uh i won't get too bogged into the details but basically a jury believed that the subscribers were wronged here and there was a $4.7 billion verdict in that class action lawsuit, which was huge against the NFL. So the National Football League was going to have to pay $4.7 billion. They appealed and U.S. District Judge Philip Gutierrez ruled that testimony from two of the witnesses for the plaintiffs should have been excluded for flawed methodologies. Uh, quote from from the this uh, you know judge's um, ruling without the testimonies of Dr. Uh, Daniel Rasher and Dr. John Zona, no reasonable jury could have found class-wide injury or damages. Uh, 
uh, at the end of the 16 page ruling. And this is from uh, NFL.com. So it's, it's obviously their PR arm, right? And they're obviously happy about it. And there's almost certainly going to be another appeal by the plaintiffs and things of that nature. But here's why I'm bringing this up and where it connects to everything. If you followed this case, um, particularly the work of Paul Gift, um, who, again, I hold in pretty high regard in this stuff, um, and, and you even just have seen excerpts from reporting on the trial where Bulware seems to be kind of out of his depth with some of this stuff, right? A important thing that has been mentioned throughout this case is that the plaintiff's methodologies and, and, and accounting, you know, uh, formulas used for calculating damages with wage share, uh, is, is novel, right? It's new. This is not something that is, is a tried, trusted method of calculating damages. It is a, a pretty newer method. Um, I mean, it, it, that, that should have probably been disputed more. And, and if you go back and read some of Giff's tweets about what was going on and some of his, his reporting, right? Like he was confused a little bit from an economist standpoint of, you know, some of this stuff was just accepted or allowed in when not, not being challenged in a way that you would expect maybe. Um, that connection, right? comes in the fact that you just had a $4.7 billion lawsuit overturned because two experts' methodologies were flawed and they thought there was no way the jury could believe them without that testimony. I would imagine if the plaintiff's expert was thrown out, which I believe is Hal Singer, right? Um, if his methodologies were deemed flawed here, you'd have no choice but to throw out any verdict and no reasonable jury would, would believe them. And that's the thinking behind TKO um, TKOs and, and Mark Shapiro's comments. Right. Um, I, I think it's very much a, we just saw a huge ruling overturned because of kind of novel, untested um, analysis. We're going to look at pursuing this all the way through because we believe we can argue that point at trial and maybe win that on appeal. And based on this ruling, we feel emboldened now that that's an even better option than before. Right. Um, and it makes sense. It makes sense. If you're looking at this, right. You're obviously not happy if you're TKO because you thought this was, you know, finally settled, you were going to be able to split out the payment, have it be partially a tax write off. And then you, you saw a pretty big increase in their stock over the next couple of months, uh, not just from how well they're doing, but, you know, this was a rain cloud that had been hanging over them for a bit and you think it's gone and then suddenly the judge throws it out. You don't want to go back and necessarily pay more, right? Um, if it's not that much more, maybe you do just so, again, you can get rid of it and you just kind of eat it. Again, you're such a profitable business if there's no, you know, big changes to your contracts or the way things, your business model then sure, maybe you just pay a little bit more and it's annoying, but you, you just get it done with. Um, but you've got to be looking at this decision and this you know ruling and think, well, we could also just take it to trial because if a jury does somehow find us guilty, we've got good grounds for appeal and we have a ruling now that would support such grounds for appeal. And again, keep in mind, right? Like this is going to, from a plaintiff's perspective, this is going to drag things out. There's going to be more cost involved, uh, more money to their lawyers, and it's going to drag everything out, especially the Johnson case, which will have to go through discovery and do all these things. It's going to drag this out for a while. It will, you would think, be much quicker than the 10 years it took us to get to this point. But there's a solid chance that, again, the UFC is and, and TKO is willing to just pay their lawyers to defend that because it's going to be less than a settlement anyway. 
and the plaintiffs are going to be struggling to, you know, deal with this. I mean, especially from a degree of, especially from a degree of, you know, some of these fighters were, were it wasn't, you know, retire and, and live on a beach type money, but it was significant money and monetary values that were going out based on your, you know, tenure and, and whether you were a main event fighter and things of that nature. So some people were going to get, you know, tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of dollars, which is not jump change. Uh, now, I'm not saying, again, that this is from a moral standpoint or anything like that. This is the right move, blah, blah, blah. And and this does open up the avenue again for greater change because the settlement before had one or two minor contract changes, but nothing that was going to like reinstatement of the sunset clauses, five years, all that stuff. Um, or I don't think it was five years it was revised, but there, there were some minor contract changes, but it wasn't anything that was going to substantially affect the UFC's business model. You do now reopen the door that, you know, maybe you get something close to a, oh, well, you know, exclusivity is, is as punishment for the UFC's wrongdoings, exclusivity on contracts is waived for a year. So that r- right now, Sean O'Malley wins a UFC Noche and then can walk across the street to BFL and say, hey, I want to fight for you guys. Will you pay me more type thing and and drive up their price and drive up everybody's prices, right? Which that could cause true upheaval to the business model. That could be a real threat um, to UFC and TKO. But the odds of that happening are still relatively small and still far off. Remember that when... Bulware rejected this agreement. The plaintiffs, you know, themed a little antsy about it, and rightfully so, I think. It's I, I know it looks hopeful in some ways, and I'm not saying it's not. You know, I, I did not think that this was going to originally get class certified, so I am I have been wrong before, and I'd be happy to run, be wrong again. But there's a, a fair amount more risk involved here, right? Especially because you could end up going to trial, and even if you win, then having it be overturned on appeal because of flawed methodologies, which Shapiro has now signaled to everyone that's paying attention, especially the plaintiff's lawyers, which I'm sure they are, that like, this is going to be a potential route we take. So you need to, maybe if we offer another deal, you take it, or we're just going to, you know, look to this and, and say, look, here's, here's some ammo we have. Right. So we'll see where it ends up. Um, it's definitely an interesting situation, but uh, yeah, it's his, his comments and linking that they are more emboldened than ever to go to trial. I think the, the UFC, um, because I think they, from their perspective, you know, they've got enough grounds for appeal and they've got challenges to singers methodology that, uh, they believe, you know, even in a worst case scenario where a jury says, Nope, yep, you're guilty of this, pay up all this stuff they believe on appeal and using this case uh, for reference and for, you know, precedent, they'll be able to get things overturned. So again, they still don't want to go to trial. It drags things out. It's still that rain cloud, but we'll see where this ends up. Uh, Let me know your thoughts on it. Are you happy that the case is reopened, that there's maybe options for change? Um, are, Are you thinking the judge made the right call here. Give give me your thoughts on this. I'm very curious to hear from the community because this one is quite a doozy. All right. So next up, and this ties into some things we just talked about. We're going to talk a little bit about some potential headwinds that have popped up for TKO, right? Um, On the UFC side, we've covered some of this between the UFC Noche uh, production costs, needing to get Riyadh season involved, uh, the ticket stuff and then you know trying to market towards uh potential potential media partners which ticket sales don't matter as much there i think pay-per-view numbers will be a little bit more important and they'll especially if they're up for noche um they'll be able to kind of point to that for any media partners because that's what media partners really care about but and the prelims viewership of course um but you know, we, there's also the antitrust lawsuit, which we just covered, uh, and 
how that is now a another rain cloud that has come back on the UFC side of things. Other than that, the UFC, you know, does have to worry about um, just a couple of different things with some fighters and contracts, but for the most part, they're fine, right? Like D, uh, what a DWCS Dana White's Contender Series. Jeez, uh, always makes me feel like I'm going to say Dancing with the Stars or some whatever that acronym is. Um, that's doing real well in terms of just churning out uh, people that then are getting signed and then bringing the overall and average fighter athlete cost down, right? Which is what the UFC wants. Um, PFL has made some moves. PFL Africa uh, coming up is a important thing. Um, and and they've made some acquisitions. And Francis Ngannou is getting into a PFL cage post Anthony Joshua uh, beat down. So that's important because even though PFL is going to almost certainly lose money on that event because of just the cost of Ngannou's purse, that's more of a, a you know investment for them, right? That's a, Hey, we're going to have Nganu here. Let's see how much he really moves the needle. Let's see how many new or potential new, um, customers we can get and get them converted to become PFL fans. Hey, we're the alternative of the UFC, right? That type of thing. It's, it's something where again, it, it does not help them monetarily now, but sometimes you have to, you have to spend money to make money. I hate that phrase, but that's, very true. And that's what that event will be, right? Is, is Nganu versus uh, Fahera w- is, is exactly that. Uh, now, if Nganu loses somehow or there's some issues, then there's a whole problem. But I mean, if Nganu goes out there and looks like the monster we expect him to, uh, it's going to be very interesting to see where that leads to in terms of new consumers of the product and things of that nature. Other than that, though, UFC is in pretty solid shape. WWE, on the other hand, is facing a couple of potential headwinds. And again, I'm not the WWE expert guy, um, but there are some things I feel that are happening, especially because they're tied all together in TKO. Um, UFC and WWE, we have to talk about. And one would be that WWE's biggest competitor, uh, AEW, seems pretty much poised to ink a new media rights deal and have it be a substantial increase to what they are currently doing. Now, I don't have any insider information here that I can really report on and, and oh, it's whatever, but there are several uh, prominent wrestling reporters that you can look up and, and they've got different takes and things on it and... You know what they're what they're reporting is is that it's pretty much a done deal. It's just a matter of when they're going to announce it, things of that nature. Um, and Tony Khan, the you know uh, CEO of AEW, right, president CEO, um, has said like you know AEW is here to stay on TBS, uh, things like that. So I mean he, he's that would imply that a media rights deal, an extension with Turner, their current media rights broadcasting partner. Uh, that deal is, is pretty much done. Now, why am I bringing this up? Well, here's the thing. Um, them getting more money and viewership. Again, WWE is easily the flagship. And WWE has been undergoing what I would call a UFCification in terms of sponsorships and things of that nature. Um, I was on the Pollock and Thurston show uh couple weeks back and i didn't bring this up i should have i was recovering from covid had some covid brain uh kicked myself after this but um right after the tko earnings call right um we went on talked about that and a big thing that came out of that was just how sponsorship heavy they seem to be going and if you look over the past year or so you can see that just how the the octagon is now littered with sponsors. You've got rankings with sponsors, all this other stuff. They're they're doing that with the WWE product, right? You saw it at WrestleMania with some Prime stuff positioned in a certain way and Prime in the middle of the ring. Um, they're, they're getting more and more sponsorship and they're trying to utilize some of the connections and things they've learned from 
UFC sponsorship deals, which is, is a big part of their revenue in a place that again, they've been growing and working to grow um, because it's, it's kind of an untapped line of revenue. They feel they can continue to increase with good margin and they are bringing those, you know, lessons learned and methodologies over to WWE. And AEW getting an extension here, it is going to cause com like real competition in a lot of ways. WWE is always going to be the clear number one. That I, I, it will, it would take, I'm not going to say will, it would take a long time to unseat WWE or a major event or two, right? Like another McMahon scandal or something where a bunch of big wrestlers all just hated working at WWE and then immediately jumped ship to AEW uh, when their contracts were all up. So all the stars left, something crazy. But they they are not quite at the level of UFC in terms of standalone brand and brand power, right? It's not a, but but it's it's close. And they've been working to get there. Part of the reason why is that WWE has had competition with bigger stars going places and lasting longer. Um, and then some of the, you know, down years, right? AEW got a good spark during some of the down years because some bigger WWE names had left and then essentially started their own company and was an alternative to WWE when WWE wasn't doing so hot. Now that WWE has really picked up and is hot again, AEW has taken a hit in their viewership and their attendance and all of that, but they've, they still are viable. And obviously they're now getting an increase in their media rights deal. Um, we'll have to see if it'll make them profitable or not. If even if they're not profitable, they're going to be much closer than they were. And it shows significant value. And a very important piece here is that one wrestler on the AEW side, um, there was a report out that his, Swerve Strickland, who was their champion, just changed hands not too long ago, um, just just a couple of weeks ago, actually. Um, he got a big contract extension signed with AEW, and there was a report that WWE wasn't super happy because apparently they believed Strickland was overpaid, and you know it, it was just such a large number that it sets the wrong tone in the industry for wrestlers. And Strickland kind of on social media kind of hinted at that this was sort of true through some of the things that were said, uh, alluding to text messages and things of that nature. But where I'm going with all this and where this ties into the UFC side uh, is, and, and TKO is that report, right? Highlights that when there is another competitor out there to grab stars, it will inevitably, right? Like those wrestlers talk to each other, right? And and from a wrestler perspective, they're just like fighters. They're just trying to get paid. And they're they're far more cohesive and together than say fighters, right? Like there was talk of starting a union back in the day that was quashed, but like in, if and and I don't know that they really could unionize at this point, but wrestlers especially because you you have to work with some of these guys and do these storylines and and work on your spots and choreography and things wrestlers are far more like oh he's jumping ship to this other company it's all he's getting paid that's awesome and and happy for each other when that type of stuff happens it's far less like true competitive like oh i want to beat his face and i don't care what he does it's like it's much more of a relationship right um with your fellow wrestler because you all have to work together and do these angles and and it's storytelling and all this other stuff so this is a scenario where they're going to talk to each other they're going to find out how much he was paid and how some of the other talent was paid over there and you're never going to ha stop having as long as AEW exists as a viable company, you're never going to stop having people switch back and forth. That's bad from a WWE perspective because that means their athlete costs inevitably are going to have to go up so that they can match and compete with AEW for some of their bigger stars, right? They won't be everybody, but there will certainly be bigger stars who are like, well, I can go make more like this over in AEW and like I'm going to make two or three million dollars more. And that's probably 
too much. I mean, it depends on the star, but you know, I can go make a million dollars more over an AEW than with you. Why would I not go over there? And WWE is going to have to evaluate and say, no, we kind of need you over here. All right, we'll match that. And then they say, okay, I'll stay. But that, that inevitably ups your costs. Right. And that's what a true competitor does. Now, again, in terms of head to head competition, I cannot see a path forward in the foreseeable future for AEW to suddenly overtake WWE and be the de facto number one. That seems like it would take decades minimum, minimum to do, um, barring some major scandal. But this is something that the PFL is working to be on the UFC side. And this is where it all ties back together. If PFL can begin to mimic what AEW is doing to WWE, that's going to cause rising costs, right? Uh, and that's that's PFL's goal, right? PFL's goal is not to unseat the UFC in a year, in probably even five years, right? It's to slowly take away their market share and essentially build and invest in something that can eventually compete with the UFC at a bigger level, right? Make no mistake, they're they're not happy to just sit on the sidelines. They say, oh, we're a different product order. No, that's their differentiator, but they're they're competing with the UFC and they're competing for the same resources as the UFC. And we've talked about competitive advantages where scarcity and, re- and and asymmetrical control of resources gives you a massive competitive advantage. Those are, are conditions that are needed, which is if you have the top fighters and only you have access to them, right? The very best fighters, scarcity, and you only have access to them, they're exclusive contracts with you. That gives you far more market share and competitive advantage than if you have to bid and share those, uh, you know, share those resources, right? You're not going to gain as much. And again, PFL is not going to challenge the UFC any, anytime soon, but it's important to call out because as WWE faces these headwinds, UFC could potentially face them. And even though TKO is killing it in terms of revenue and, and on track for all this stuff, the other big thing to remember with public traded companies is investors only care about going up, right? If you're staying the same, they don't love that unless you're paying out a a pretty big dividend. And if you're going down even just a little bit, they will hammer you for it. It doesn't matter that you did $900 million in profit last year. You have to do 1.1 billion this year. It doesn't matter that you did 1.1 billion this year. You have to do 1.3 billion next year, right? So on and so forth. It's all about continuous growth. The minute you show stagnation, you start to get hurt because investors are saying, okay, this is kind of plateaued. This is topped out. I'm not going to be able to get as much value growth here. I'm going to pull my money, invest in something that's you know on the rise. That's a huge part of the market and something that I see consistently where people are like, oh, they've, they're making so much profit. They can... That's not a big deal that this happened or whatever. It's not a big deal in terms of their fundamentally sound but their value, a huge amount of their value is tied and inflated, right? $21 billion, what they said, they're not fundamentally, you know, they don't have $21 billion of cash and other assets around that make it like, here you go. Like a huge part of that is future growth and value. And you need to continually grow in order to satisfy that requirement. The minute that drops off, problems. If you don't believe me, look at when Apple was still the, I forget what year it was like 2019, 2020 essentially had the biggest profit recorded ever in a company, something along those lines, just, just outright, you know, ridiculous, but it didn't meet analyst expectations and the stock dropped because of it. Imagine being the most profitable company in history, but you didn't quite meet what people predicted. So your stock was sold because of it. People sold your stock because of that. That's the market. And that's an important thing to look at because when we're talking about why TKO, both UFC and WWE are so cutthroat on so many things, it's because of that mindset, right? You made it to this step, great. We're never going backwards. We can only stay here, which is bad, or we go up, which is good. 
If we go down, it's it's a disaster. It's a huge problem. It's a it's a headwind that you know now we're in trouble and we've got to adjust things and hire consultants. I mean that's that's for different industries, but that that's that's the corporate mindset, right? That's the publicly traded company mindset. So those are potential headwinds TKO is going into at the end of the year. Are they going to hit their you know ex expected um, you know revenue guidance for the year? I think yes, still just because of how massive. Um, the beginning of the year was, and, and I mean, I know they revised it up and, and obviously the sphere, uh, and, and UFC Noche may hit that a little bit, but I mean, I, they're still doing so well. I would imagine they're in a good enough spot for that, but yeah, that that's a huge part of this. And these are the biggest potential headwinds the UFC is facing, but besides and, and TKO is facing, uh, besides the, uh, antitrust lawsuit being, you know, something we already talked about. So, I'm going to also just as as a you know heads up here. Um, I'm going to have to talk about WWE and you know wrestling stuff sometimes too. I'm not the experts in expert in that area, right? Uh, I I would never call myself an expert in the realm of that business. Um, again, highly recommend you follow Pollock and Thurston, who have been killing it in that realm for a while now. Um, but, you know, when it comes to the TKO analysis, got to look at both companies. They're joined at the hip now. So if you don't like this section, I'm sorry. They're going to keep coming up. But, yeah, you know, is what it is. I think I still think it's worth it for you to listen to it, even if you're just a UFC fan and you think wrestling is dumb, because I'll always at least try and connect it back to MMA. So let me know your thoughts on this. Uh, let me know if I missed any other potential headwinds, especially on the wrestling side. If some of you know some of the wrestling business a little bit more more than happy to hear and, and look into some of that stuff but yeah this is what i see tko having to deal with basically for the in, end of the year at least all right two more quick topics to cover before we wrap it up for today one of those being uh jake paul's comments regarding conor mcgregor's contract and what's going on with that why he's apparently not fighting this year and running for president of ireland uh yeah we're not we're not gonna dive into his his presidential claims but um we are gonna talk about paul's comments so jake paul on a podcast i don't know if it was his or what other one it was um forget who he was talking to too I'm, I'm, big shocker i'm not a huge jake paul fan i didn't you know listen intently i just heard the clip uh so his comments were that Conor McGregor is not fighting this year and is two fights left on his contract. And they are withholding McGregor's fights right now because they want to use the UFC wants to use that as part of the upcoming media rights negotiations, right? Um, saying, Hey, if you sign with us or sorry, if, if you sign us, if you, if you pay us what we want, you're going to have, guaranteed two conor mcgregor fights right we, he's got two fights on the contract you know that's a that's a big deal um was an interesting comment for a couple of reasons right um it, it sounds two fights left on the contract sounds about right from what i know um because he had signed an extension a while ago but i mean he's I think he's run through most of that. Um, and so, yeah, I, th I think he's around two or three fights. I, I I don't know for sure, but I will say that it, it would not saying there's two fights left on McGregor's deal is not like outlandish. It's not an outlandish claim. It's like, okay, yeah, I can see that. Um, I can see that being the case. And, and again, don't have any other inside info on that. If I find some, I will let you know. Um, I've reached out to some people I know. I don't know if they'll get back to me, but, um, but yeah, that that's a potential pot potential validity there, right? I, I I would believe it. Let's let's assume for the sake of argument that is correct. The UFC withholding McGregor fights as part of the media rights negotiations. Well, here's the thing with that, right? Um, I believe. I believe that to an extent, but what we do know 
from UFC contracts is that the UFC has to offer a certain number of fights per year to a fighter. If they don't, then they're in breach and it's a whole thing. Um, now, we also know in interviews with past fighters like Francis and Ganu, they can be a little tricky about it sometimes, right? And say like, hey, we're going to offer you a fight when we kind of know you can't take one so that you get an extension added to your contract. And they might be playing that game with McGregor, but one would assume McGregor is on top of it enough and has the resources uh, to kind of push back on that, where if he thought that was happening or he cared, right, he might not care if that's happening. Or he might, you know, he might be in agreement like, okay, no, that's fine. I'll You want to extend me, but, you know, not extend my number of fights. Great. Then cool. Like, like we can just wave this out. We'll come to some sort of arrangement. We'll figure it out. Um, which we'll talk about here in a sec, but, uh, you would assume that McGregor would have the resources and the team. And again, it is an assumption because you never know, especially how lost in, in the, you know, life that McGregor is currently living. He currently is. Um, but I think no matter way, you, no matter which way you cut it, that only lasts for so long too i believe right like even if the ufc is doing that they can only do it so many times and without it becoming an issue and and all of that um again for the sake of argument let's assume that okay this is happening they are trying to extend and and extend him and and withhold fights or work out an agreement with him that hey we're gonna wait to have you fight so that we can use you as a, a bargaining chip in an upcoming media rights deal. It's not the wildest claim, right? It's not the most crazy thing I've heard of. Uh, having two guaranteed Conor McGregor fights on your streaming service or your network or what have you is nice to know and nice to have, especially because you know there is no guarantee that McGregor re-signs with the UFC. We've seen him struggle in fights as of late. Um, and we've seen him essentially become part owner of BKFC, which if he were to go to BKFC, right, I'm sure they would shell out as much money as they possibly could for someone like McGregor's purse. But then if he were to go there and then have a fight in bare knuckle, um, you've got to imagine he's going to be able to negotiate a huge amount of any pay-per-view buys and he's still Conor McGregor. So he's still likely to generate a fairly big number. Even if he were to lose his next two fights in the UFC, he goes to BKFC. It's a new gimmick of bare knuckle and all this stuff. I'm sure they'd find an opponent for him to make it a little bit interesting and sell. And then you're in a position of, well, okay. Like, Let's say you only let's say you only sell seven hundred k, which would be low for a Conor McGregor fight, right? If he could get like half of those pay per view buys, and you have him at like fifty dollars a piece, he's getting twenty five dollars a pot, something like that, something crazy. He can make way more money than he ever did with the UFC. And as a part owner, again, he's probably got a lot more. I mean, he definitely has way more negotiating power with a smaller promotion like BKFC to do that. Now, in order to get there, he's still got to fight twice in the UFC and he's still got to, you know, go through all those hoops. So it may be part of an arrangement of, you know, he's kind of signaled this or the, or TKO really believes he's going to go do that. And they're like, okay, well we need to hold off on your fight so we can get this new media rights deal. And then once the new media rights deal is locked in, do whatever. Cause if we get it for seven years, 10 years, right. Do something like what WWE did with Netflix, then, okay, go ahead and sell your pay-per-views, make your money. That's great. Yeah, we're we're not happy we're losing out on that, but we've leveraged you in a way that we've upped our media rights. That makes some sense. I could easily see McGregor and the UFC coming to an agreement to say, hey, look, we're going to, you know, we need you to reject these fights or we're just going to hold off on scheduling you for a while so that we can get this deal done. The minutes it's inked, we'll get you booked. Uh, we'll, you know, maybe throw in a little bit of bonus here and there. And, you know, a side bonus, a locker room bonus, so to speak, for doing this. We'll get you booked. We'll get you good to go. And, 
yeah, then you can go fight in BKFC if you want. Now, I have no idea if he's actually going to go to BKFC. He might very well re-up with the UFC. Um, he might, you know, retire from fighting altogether. He's he's definitely at a point where he's got more than enough money to do that and has a bunch of other businesses going on and things of that nature. And from what I can tell, he's not, you know, run through all of his crazy money yet. And I don't think he will, um, at least in the next five years. So, yeah. I mean, he he could hypothetically do that. And it would be prudent of the UFC to say, hey, we need to, you know, keep a couple fights left because obviously two McGregor fights on your your service is far better than one. Sure, if he fights Chandler, let's say, let's say he fights Chandler the in December or what have you. Okay, like that is great and that's that helps the UFC in the short term, but long term when you're trying to go negotiate media rights, it's not nearly as good as having two McGregor fights in your back pocket, right? And so that's the type of thing where I could easily believe that claim. Now, is that what's actually happening? I do not know. I, I have not heard any info on that, but does it sound like a very real possibility to me? Yes, it does, especially from what I do know in the industry. Like, could easily see that being the case. TKO and, and Endeavor and everybody running that is very numbers driven. I'm sure they've played out some of these scenarios in their head. And along with the marketing ploy that I believe UFC Noche is, would make a lot of sense to hold off on McGregor fights until you have a deal done, which by all accounts, I'm imagining just because sports rights are still in a weird area, right? Um, NBA just got a big re-up, all this other stuff. They want to make that deal as soon as possible. Especially when you have somebody like the NBA just make the deal they made. You want to try and piggyback off of that and say, look at what everybody signed for the NBA. Like, we're a huge property. Here's all our metrics. Here's how amazing we are with our UFC Noche events. We've got two Conor McGregor fights. We want a multi tier deal like that. We want it to be double, two and a half times what we originally had, right? Like, you, you want to try and piggyback off that if you can. So, um, because, because the marketing, or sorry, the marketing, the, the media rights landscape might, might collapse too, right? Like, if, the overall macroeconomics fall apart, which I've talked about multiple times that they haven't yet, but if they do, that undercuts your ability to sell your product and get the media rights you want. So you just had a massive deal that blew out original expectations for it. You want to piggyback off that. It's as as far as and, and as early as possible as you can. You want you want to try and ride that out. So that's where I stand on the Paul McGregor comments. Let me know your thoughts on it. Um, it is disappointing. He's not going to fight Chandler this year. Chandler seems to have moved on, or at least there's rumors of him moving on. We'll see where that goes. But yeah, I could easily see them waiting. And, and I guess time will tell. Uh, I'll let you know if I hear anything else. But that's that's where I stand on on those Jake Paul comments, I guess. All right. Last thing we're going to briefly touch on today is some information about Ryzen and their you know strategy in terms of the pay-per-view market. So uh, from our good friend of the show, uh, Drake Riggs, which this was seven months ago. So I did miss this, I'll admit, uh, but I do want to bring it up now. Um, and shout out to Drake for this info. Um, Ryzen 45 apparently did near... To what the match, which was a kickboxing match um, in Japan, he, widely successful pay-per-view kickboxing match in Japan, near to what they did in terms of pay-per-view numbers. Now, the match did 500,000 buys. So for the sake of argument, let's say they did 450,000 buys. Well, well, we'll just say 500. It's going to make it easier. So let's say Ryzen 45 did 500,000 pay-per-view buys. That's nothing to scoff at, right? That is big. Now, mind you, I think pay-per-views are 20 bucks, 20 bucks-ish. Um, maybe a little bit more, but I mean, significantly cheaper than say a UFC pay-per-view or even what, you know, PFL is trying to sell moving forward type of thing. But that's still, you know, 20, let's say $20 a pop at 500,000 buys. That's 20 or sorry, $10 million, right? That's $10 million in revenue there. You cut expenses and different carriers and all that stuff. It's, it's less profit, but that's still several million dollars in profits for one event. 
that's huge for a promotion not named the UFC, right? The, the, it's it, You always have to frame it where the last promotion to do that outside the UFC probably goes back to, I guess, Bellator. I'm trying to think what Bellator's pay-per-view buys were like for some of their ones when like Tito and Chael fought. I think they were like 150 or 100,000 at $50 or something like that. Um, similar esque i would say um but but i think you know let's say if, if i similar esque but i, I still want to say ryzen overshadowed them i think you have to probably go back to pride and strike force maybe i'm sure i'm missing something in between pride and strike force um uh like xfl something so or not xfl uh, extreme fight the yeah, extreme fight league you know what i'm talking about exc there we go uh there there's definitely one in there Right, but it's it's been a long time. It's been at least a decade. Easy. That much I'm pretty sure I can say. Unless I'm missing one Bellator one. And again, feel free to correct me if I'm wrong. Unless I'm missing a big Bellator pay-per-view here uh, that occurred somewhere. That That's the biggest number for a promotion outside the UFC in over a decade. That's huge. And we're talking about Ryzen, right? We're, we're not talking about... We're talking about a promotion that is is consistently labeled third fourth in terms of popularity in the u.s and and if that right like it's it's when when you could very much argue that one championship because they've had events here is more popular than ryzen right so you you could you could be looking at near like last where people don't even know ryzen exists fair about i'm sure a fair amount of mma fans in the u.s don't know residences and they're doing those kinds of numbers and they've talked about wanting to make inroads in the pay-per-view market that's very big for a lot of reasons right um they've had some legal issues and things they've they've navigated over the past couple of years it's not been the smoothest road for rising out of late but they've also done good collaboration with bellator with their rising versus bellator events and even though Ryzen hasn't fared super well, it's given them extra visibility on their fighters. Uh, you've had, um, you know, Horiguchi, who went from the UFC over to Ryzen, be a big name. Uh, you, you've got a couple of names. I think Kai uh, Asakura is now going to be in the UFC coming over, right? Uh, oh, man, I'm just blanking right now. I apologize. Uh, flyweight guy, big name, gets hurt all the time. Uh Cape, Manel, or cop, Manel, right? He was in Ryzen first. Jerry fought in Ryzen before he came over to the UFC. Ryzen going for pay-per-view, especially at the numbers that they've been able to do, like Ryzen 45, is a great strategy. And it's a very important one because it's a very profitable one. It it go it you know calls back to the days of the UFC before they had the big media rights deal right where they like the company lived and breathed on how many pay-per-view buys they could do and when you had a down year or i think it was 2014 2015 with some in injuries like it, it hurt and it was a problem um you needed these big events you needed things to sell if a star pulled out it caused a wave of controversy right uh it, it caused a lot of problems and headaches from a revenue perspective from the ufc Ryzen going this path is not necessarily a stable one, but it is one that they can succeed at because nobody else is really going in for that pay-per-view, at, at, especially at that price point, right? If they're able to get enough viewers to say, yeah, I'll throw 20 bucks on this and and get the buys consistently around 400 to 600,000 buys, I mean, that's going to give them a big chunk of revenue that will be important moving forward. They'll, they'll face the same cons to that strategy that the UFC did back in 2014 and that other promotions have had to deal with, but they've at least found that it can be viable. And that's very big considering their TV deal had some issues, right? They got dropped and all this other stuff. They've been, the media rights for them has been rocky as of late. So if they can carve their own path with pay-per-view buys and then control their own destiny that way, hypothetically get into a situation where, hey, we're doing all these pay-per-view buys and we can negotiate a similar type deal that the UFC did when they went off of you know, pay-per-view buys and things of that nature for a much smaller amount, of course, that's huge for them. That That's viable 
profitability for a promotion outside the UFC, which is always important, right? Because when we talk about profitability, you know, one is looking at finally maybe being profitable given all of the cutbacks they've had and all this stuff, but it's not guaranteed. And they've been talking about profitability for a long time. PFL is not profitable yet. Uh, if you want to count the investment that they got, then I maybe, but I mean, even then it's, I mean, that's not free money, right? So it's just like, Hey, here's this. they're definitely not profitable in their, in their operations yet. They still have to get there. Bellator had profitable years, but then it turned back into the red profitability in this industry is extremely hard. So it's something to keep an eye on, something I will be keeping an eye on for sure. And something I wanted to bring up because this, this may be a use case for other promotions, right? Should rise and be successful at this. It may show other up and coming promotions. Hey, like we can get a couple of older vets, UFC vets or Bellator vets over and start to build our name enough. We can go to pay-per-views. We can go sell low. We can look at this being an option. Um, It'll be very interesting, but yeah, I wanted to call that out because I think it is important to look at promotions outside just the UFC. And this is, this is a very interesting development to me. So let me know your thoughts on it. Let me know if you're buying rides and pay-per-views. If you like rising shows, I personally do. Uh, I want that. I want the old tournament style, New Year's Eve tournament style back so bad, uh, which they do have sometimes, but I want it to be like a one night thing or two night thing. Uh, unlikely, but still, um, Man, I miss that stuff. But yeah, no, I mean, let, let me know your thoughts. Let me know if you were buying Rise and Pay-Per-Views. All right, everybody. Well, that wraps it up for another Fight Business Podcast. Appreciate everybody listening on Apple, Spotify. I think Stitcher is dead, so not that. But any any audio platform, um, if you're watching on YouTube, make sure, again, to hit the like, subscribe, bell notification. Um, appreciate you guys as always. I'm not even going to try to attempt to say I'm going to be more consistent coming back because I've got so much going on. And every time I try to say that, it doesn't happen. So I'm just not going to say anything and hopefully it happens. But always appreciate and love you guys. I'm glad to be back and at least recording again. Um, so that's great. But yeah, I, I can't thank you enough for the support. And until next time, y'all, get money. <laughs>